Thank you all for coming out tonight. And as always, we'll open with a prayer. And I'm going to put Mr. Winchester on the spot. Would you? Let us pray. Oh, God, we thank you for the great privilege of assembling here together as people of your people. We thank you that we have this opportunity to try to help our neighbors and our county and our people to have a better status of life. We thank you for that great opportunity, the many blessings you give to us. And we pray for helping God us as an organization and help us to do good to all people. And we just uh, thank you for our speaker coming to uh, give us additional information on how to be better people to serve thee. We thank you for the food for us, and we pray for goodness in this meeting and happiness. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And if you'd all join me by standing in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It is a privilege to have you guys here tonight. I appreciate you coming out. Uh, one little thing I want to say before we start this, at, at the risk of sending, sounding immodest by bringing this up, I was bl uh, honored with an award as uh, Chairman of the Year at the State Convention. Uh, uh, and I don't bring it up to pat myself on the back. I could not have done this without Steve and John and Elliot and Daniel and my buddy over here, Gilda. But especially John, when they gave the I, classic Rick, I was in the restroom when they gave out the award, so I didn't actually hear what they said about me when they gave it or about us. So... From what I understand, they said secondhand, it was because of the live stream and the social media stuff we've been doing was the reason we got we got the recognition. And I want to give my thanks to John for winning me that award because without John, it's, none of this would happen. It was my idea. John made it happen. So it's it's as much or more John than it is me. And I got the I got the thing sitting the, the award sitting on my mantle at home, but it's as much his as it is mine. It really is. I'm not just trying to show off, and I mean it sincerely. Thank you. Uh, now that that's out of the way, uh, our senator Rex Rice would like to say a word or two. So anytime Mr. Rice wants the mic, he gets it. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate it. Really, I just wanted to come back. And I will be brief. And when I say be brief, usually when you hear a politician say that, that's dangerous. <laughs> but, Rick, I did. I want to come by and say I'm proud to be a member of the Pickens County Republican Party. And it is Pickens County Republican Party. That's where I live. <laughs> and I just I wanted to come by and say congratulations to you and the team because I guarantee you that it took a team effort for you to get the award. And I know you realize that. And it's not only that, it's, it's going way back in history to our chairman in, 19, in 88, I believe. Walt, is that right? That's right. And, uh, of course, Walt got me uh, hogtied into working the polls in 1988, right. back when there weren't a whole lot of people going to the Republican polls then. So. You got a good memory. And uh, you, you, did, you did a good job getting it started, and you brought Pickens County around to be the leadership in the Republican Party here. And thank you for what you did. But, Rick. Thank you. Like I say, I'm proud to be a member of this party in Pickens County because we are one of the top Republican parties in the state of South Carolina because of this team right here. So thank you. Thank you. Well. Well, Paul McCartney, for some reason, thought he could throw a concert the same night that we're having a meeting, too. I've got about five or six uh, messages from people, Joanne uh, Brewer and uh, several other people. They're all at the concert tonight. Huh. But without further ado, you all didn't come to hear me huff and puff. You came to hear somebody worth listening to. And we are honored to have 
the Comptroller General of South Carolina, the man who handles the checkbook for the state and makes it, tries to make it balance anyway, makes sense. We're honored to have you drive up here from Columbia Night and your wife, Kelly. Always good to see you. So without further ado, Richard Ekstrom, Comptroller General of South Carolina. Oh, one last, one last thing. We are added, we, we doing something a little extra tonight or a little different. I don't know how it'll work out or if it even happened or not. But I'm going to take questions through email. We put that out today. So any email questions, people in the room get priority because you showed up. But I will be looking for email questions on our, on our uh, website to ask you too from people watching at home. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Rex, you were elected to the House 94? I remember that because I was out campaigning at the same time and would bump into you. I was living over in Greenville at the time. It's been a long time, yeah. And I served, I served a single term. I was elected that year as state treasurer. Served a single four-year term as state treasurer. And then I don't know if you remember it. I left office due to illness. The voters got real sick of me. <laughs> <laughs> and I came back uh, four years later and ran for controller general, which is really what my background is. I'm a CPA. I was with an international CPA firm over in Greenville uh, when I decided to, to run for office. And one of the things that dawned on me is that state government oftentimes operates as if the finances don't matter. As long as you can raise taxes, you can keep the books balanced. You'll always have money to spend on this or that. And that, to me, seemed like a recipe for financial disaster. And I know the taxpayers agree with that assessment. Uh, Rex, I know, agrees with that. I've always really uh, admired Rex for his conservatism. Uh, and in this area of the state, there's that conservatism that's alive and well. That's not the case for many areas of our state. Uh, we have good Democrats in this state, a few. Conservative Democrats, we have good conservative Republicans in this state. We have many elected officials who take a label, a party label, without really knowing what the party stands for. And I always uh, evaluate all decisions based on how is this going to affect the people who really pay for this. And that's the people like, like us, the taxpayers of this state. Uh, you've heard people start out by saying, well, I got good news and bad news. You've heard that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a variation of that. I've got bad news and bad news. Which do you want to hear first? <laughs> it's not all bad. Uh, although I do want to talk about, about two areas where our state is really missing the boat financially. And one is uh, in the area of, of uh, road Spend, road maintenance spending. As you all are painfully aware, as your pocketbooks are painfully aware, uh, you know, um, Rick, I'm not going to walk around because I'm afraid to get away from... He will, okay. Then, okay, so we're going to... How far can you go? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> taxes were raised significantly um, almost two years ago now with this what's called Act 40, which is an act that was, was a, uh, passed in Columbia to raise massive additional revenue to maintain roads. Um, now, it's almost two years ago. Massive amounts of additional revenue. Uh, the gas tax at the pump, our state gas tax had been 16 cents a gallon going back to, I don't know when, I think it was 1993 that we last raised our gas tax. Um, but this Act 40 raised the gas tax two cents per gallon per year for the next six years. So it'll go from 16 cents to 28 cents a gallon. Pretty significant increase. But then the Act also, uh, also got involved in raising taxes every time you register your car. And I don't know how many of you have had the pleasure of going to your local 
treasurer's office and paying your property tax bill on your car uh, to have your vehicle registration fee given to you. Well, that fee almost doubled. Uh, truckers really got clobbered on this one. And the reasoning, I think, in the General Assembly was that truckers are tearing up the road. So, Rick, villains like you need to pay the price. And there were a number of new fees that were imposed on, on truckers. Um, the most recent of which was imposed January of this year, uh, where there was an $87 per year additional tax. Not, the act didn't call any of these taxes, by the way. It all had fancy names for these, user fees and uh, road maintenance fees and this and that. None of, them, none of them were called taxes, but that's exactly what it was. So for every trailer that a, that a tractor hauls, those big containers, you know, they're they're taxed now at $87 per year. There's an additional property tax assessed on them. Uh, there are additional taxes assessed on your own vehicles, all to finance road construction. You say, well, we don't see a lot of road construction yet, so maybe, maybe the, the money hasn't been raised. Um, I want to tell you, the money's there. I watch it come in. And when this act was passed, I thought, well, the worst thing in the world would be to pour all these hundreds of millions of dollars into the general fund and spend out of that where you lose track of whether or not the reason for imposing these, these new taxes uh, was met. Well, the reason was to fix our roads. And in fact, the act said that these funds are restricted for use to maintain and improve the safety of our state highways, not our interstates, but our state highways. Now, some people, someone told me recently, well, we've got all this, all this road construction going on in Greenville. And I said, really, where? Oh, it's the intersection of 385 and 85. And I said, well, that was going on when I was there. But that's federal money. That's uh, for the most part. That's that's not what this this Act 40 was passed to fund that kind of construction. That construction is being funded elsewhere. Once Act 40 is fully phased in, and it'll be another four years before it's fully phased in. But once it's phased in, it will raise an additional 625 million dollars every year in perpetuity. 625 million. You say, well, that's once it's phased in. What's it looking like now? Since July of 2017, the state has raised $657 million of new taxes, has collected $657 million that it, I insisted be put in this account, where as that money is taken out, we can watch to see that that money is being spent to maintain and to improve road safety. Um, that wasn't an easy task to get the agency that oversees road construction to agree to that kind of oversight. Um, and I, you know, I can sympathize with the Department of Transportation. They're out there building roads and they don't want the public sticking their nose in their business. Does that offend you? That offended me when I ran into that, that, hey, don't interfere with our business. And my response was, you're spending the public's money. And you're, you're just withdrawing at hundreds of millions of dollars at a time. The public has a right to know how every one of those dollars is spent. And so I worked almost a year to get a report prepared by the Department of Transportation, because they have all the details for how this money is spent. And I worked with them to produce a report that shows by county in the state and by specific projects within each county, each time spending occurs. Now, I say we, we've raised $657 million today. How much do you think we've spent? Hmm? You cheating? You cheating? How'd you know? It was it. 
It was, yeah. The, um, the, the number is a little bit higher, but not much higher. It's extremely low. And I think that the Department of Transportation was a little bit self-conscious about that. And so on a couple of occasions, that agency has gone to the General Assembly to get approval to spend that money for other purposes that are kind of related, kind of related to road construction, but it's not road construction. One of those purposes is to send money out to counties for counties to use for their own transportation needs. Well, that's fine. I mean, the state has always had some working relationship with counties where it sends part of that 12 cent per gallon gas tax, distributes it out to, out to counties. They've always done that. But Act 40 said, well, we're going to, since we're raising the gas tax, we'll kick a share, uh, an additional amount out to counties. Well, Department of Transportation, being enterprising like they are, said, whoa, you're taking this maintenance money away from us. Um, we don't have the money to send to counties like we have every year in the past. Can we take it out of this, our road construction money? And the, re the reply was, yeah, fine. My problem with that is once it goes out to the counties, we can't see at the state level how that gets spent. It can get spent on bike paths, walking trails, um, whatever, parking lots. It can get spent on any number of transportation-related projects, but that's not what Act 40 was passed for, to fund miscellaneous transportation-related projects. It was passed to fix our pothole-infested roads. Now, I don't know if any of you have been up I-95 recently. I-95 runs kind of parallel to I-85, except it's excuse me, 150 miles east of here. It's in terrible shape. That interstate was built, I think it was finished maybe back in the late 60s. It was finished largely with federal money, and the feds said, well, you guys are going to be responsible for maintaining it now. Very little maintenance has ever been done on I-95. What happens to a road when it's not maintained? You're taking your life in your own hands on section of I, sections of I-95. I can tell you because two weeks ago, I drove down I-95 in the morning, which was okay because you could see the potholes in the daylight, came back at night, and it was the most dangerous, rough, pocked up highway I have ever been on. I don't know what's kept people from having serious accidents on that. But the state's position is, well, we can't spend this, this uh, Act 40 money um, on interstates, so um, let's put tolls on I-95. Um, what's happened on the Connector 2000 with tolls? Huh? There's nothing happening on that one. People avoid it because of the cost, and there's no development along Connector 2000. I mean, it's a short spur. But think of all the development opportunities if that place didn't have toll booths catching people as they're driving to and from. Um, I mean, I thought maybe we, maybe there had been the second coming and we were left behind because we were about the only car on the road when we came across that this afternoon. And my view on tolls is that, especially on interstate highways, I-95, when the state knew all along it had an obligation to maintain that road, it can't wait until there's a crisis, a maintenance crisis, to then say, hey, we don't have any way of fixing this, so let's put in tolls. And I talked to uh, some of the power brokers in Columbia about, well, you know, what do you have to raise? How much do you have to raise in tolls? And the answer was half, half a billion dollars. We have immediate needs now to repair bridges and sections of I-95 that will cost about $500 million. I said, well, I'm, I watch revenues as they come in, as they're collected from every source, income taxes, sales taxes, bank taxes, savings and loan taxes, you name it. Anything that comes into the general fund, I'm monitoring. 
I said, well, you know, you all were projecting, you budget writers were projecting that we'd collect so much this year. It looks like we're going to finish this year about $500 million ahead of what our projections were. You know, President Trump's policies are really paying off. What we've seen in our economy is not just because of what we're doing right in South Carolina. The president's policies are driving a lot of that economic growth. Now, I know you're going, well, what about tariffs? I'm not comfortable with that one. But all in all, I think those policies have been extremely favorable, beneficial to our state, to the point that South Carolina is, is an economic leader. Uh, we announced just today a new plant down in uh, Monk's Corner building a 116,000 foot manufacturing facility. It's a company owned by the Chinese, but it's got kind of an American sounding name. But um, it's going to continue to promote economic development in our state. It said it, that it located there because of our good highways, okay? <laughs> Access to the deep water port to Charleston, which the state is in the process, thanks to people like Rex, uh, of dredging out and deepening so that Charleston will, within two years, be the deepest port on the east coast of the United States, which means that we'll pick up even more traffic, shipping traffic, than we have now. But you, but, you know, you look around and you say, well, how can we support all that shipping in and out of the port? We got BMW up here. We've got Volvo down there. We've got these new companies, like the one that announced its, its, uh, its relocation today from Massachusetts. Uh, we've got the Mercedes truck plant down in the Charleston area. Um, we have just success after success after success. And we've got to make sure that we do have a transportation system that can accommodate all that success. But the only way we ought to be funding that is with resources that we have right now. There will be a tremendous amount of pressure not to do anything with this surplus, to wait until the end of the year so it can be redistributed to districts all around the state to build whatever, libraries or to finance community festivals or this or that, green bean museums, whatever. Um, and it's, it's people like us, I think, that have to let elected officials know, thankfully, we have someone like Rex Rice down there who can breathe sanity into the, into the air to say, wait a minute now. If we've got revenues, excess revenues that aren't committed, we have a real solemn responsibility to prioritize our needs. What is greater? Is it fixing interstate highways that we've ignored for decades? Or is it adding a bike path in whatever county? And, you know, there's really, when you think of it from a logical point of view, there's, there's really no questioning which is better. But political decisions aren't always based on logic. <laughs> I, I guess you've seen that. Um, and, and so sometimes political decisions are very poor. And when you see poor political decisions on the horizon, you all can have enormous impact by just letting your feelings known as to how that money ought to be used. Now, we do have significant infrastructure maintenance needs, highway maintenance needs. There's no doubt about that. For some reason, uh, we've got about a half a billion dollars sitting in a pot waiting for road repair. I don't know why. Uh, the department says, well, we can't get contractors fast enough. Well, the Department of Transportation said, we need that money immediately because we can put it into shovel-ready re jobs immediately. But they said that two years ago, and it's still sitting. So that kind of concerns me. 
I'd encourage you, though, to go to the website that, that I've developed that tracks this spending, this co the collections and spending. Here is a kind of a summary page. I'll let you all start on this side. A summary page of the money that's been collected. Uh, and it also shows how that money is being spent. You have to go to, um, to, the web, to a website, and someone might want to make a note of this in case anyone wants to follow up by looking, but if you go to, uh, I'll give you seven letters and two dots. The first two letters are CG, that stands for Controller General, CG dot, the next two letters are SC, that stands, stands for South Carolina, SS, South Carolina, and then use the second dot, and then go, G-O-V. Seven letters, two dots. Go there, and then on the top right-hand side of the page that opens, you'll see um, there's a bar across the top of the page. There is a link on the right-hand top corner to fiscal transparency. Hit that link. It takes you to a transparency site I developed, and it it, and it lists all sorts of categories, all sorts of categories, one of which is gas tax spending. And you go there and you'll get into a lot of detail. You might be interested in looking to see what projects have been funded already here in Pickens County. Now, the, the last piece of bad news I'm going to give you is South Carolina Retirement System. Are any of you covered by the South Carolina Retirement System? Will you be? Okay. Um, it is a train wreck happening in slow motion, a financial train wreck happening in slow motion. The South Carolina retirement system, under the most, the most optimistic projections, you know, estimating the most favorable possible outcomes, is $23 billion in the hole right now. $23 billion. Now, um, we are in the process of adopting next year's budget for the state. The statewide general fund budget is $9 billion. So we've got this deficit in the state retirement system that's grown through the decades to, t under the most favorable estimates, $23 billion. Um, it's my view that those favorable estimates are bogus. And I was on John Stossel's program recently to talk about how state retirement systems across the country use estimates to mask the true financial problems that their retirement systems face. And it's my estimate that we're probably closer to $35 billion in the hole. And, it, and the deficit grows by about a billion dollars every year, despite the fact that we are pumping in about $3 billion a year. So that deficit is something that will eventually kill us. I think that elected officials who know about it and who are in a position to do something about it think, well, what's the problem with that? You know, we got this federal deficit in the trillions, and we've heard all these horror stories about how the growing federal deficit is going to sink us, and we haven't sunk yet. So deficits are just something we have to get used to. Uh, I can tell you as a CPA, that's just utter nonsense, and that's a recipe for disaster. We can't do a whole lot about the federal deficit. We are in a position in this state to deal with that, that crushing deficit in our retirement system. Can we knock it out right away? By no means. But we've got to start to turn it around. And we have not been able to do anything but increase that deficit year after year after year after year for the last couple of decades. So are we going to run out of money? Not this year. So, you know, your retirement benefits are safe. I don't know how. How long do you expect to live? You know? <laughs> You're still healthy enough. Your retirement benefits will be here um, for as long as you need them. But there are a whole lot of people. There are almost 400,000 people in this state who are either 
have already retired or uh, are earning retirement through their service or beneficiaries of deceased state employees, state retirees who get continuing retirement benefits from the state. So huge, 400,000 people. Y'all are two, Rex, you're one, I'm one. Kelly's one, Kelly's a school teacher. Um, we've got to do something about this retirement system. Um, there is no bigger issue facing our state. And I thought two years ago, the budget writers had caught on. Finally, they were discussing the need to deal with the retirement system deficit. And yet for two years since, there's been no mention made of it, which I think uh, is contributing to the continued decline in the strength of our retirement system. So again, you all hold the key. Speak out, ask questions, stay informed. I know that's tough, but y'all are here tonight and I really take my hat off to you. Why would people come out on a Thursday night to hear a bean counter talk, talk about financial issues? Well, you know, I don't know why you're here. I expect some of you just wanted a good meal. But I expect most of you are here. There you go. Most of you are here because you care and you want to do something meaningful. So you're more likely to do something meaningful when you know what it is, the problems that we're facing. So that's uh, about it. My, you know, my office, I, you had a controller general from this area, I guess, at one point two decades ago who caused a lot of people to lose their retirement savings. I had nothing to do with that. I want you to know that. Um, and I came into office. Um, my agents, the agency I took over, right before I came into office, it, it was at 102 employees authorized. 102, that's high water mark. We're down to 29 now. 29. Um, I think the mistake so many people in government make is that power is defined by how many people you employ. If you have an agency, you know, you're more powerful if you employ higher numbers. You're more powerful if you have a higher budget. You're more powerful if you consume floor space. Well, those are absolutely the wrong way to measure um, benefits to taxpayers. So we've downsized, we've computerized, we've consolidated functions. I've learned that we've done so much with so few for so long that we can now do anything with no one forever. <laughs> so. oh, thank you, sir. Uh, I've got... I've got two questions to kick this off, and then I'll give it to I'll, to you guys. Uh, how would you say the best? Well, like I say, if you you, know, if you find yourself in a hole, first thing to do is quit digging, right? So, on the uh, retirement program, how would you turn it or start turning it in the other direction? Get away from uh, a definite a definite benefit and go into a 401k type thing, or how, what, what's the, what's the best way you think? That's going to slow down the decline. It's not going to eliminate the deficit because the, the deficit that we have right now is for benefits that have already been earned under the old system. Now, the old system is a system, the approach that we took for providing retirement benefits is an approach that most major corporations in this country have learned long ago is unsustainable and have gone away from the sort of retirement plan that we offer. And they've gone to, like a 401k plan, it's called a defined contribution plan. What you get in retirement is based on how much you contribute and how well the funds you contribute have been invested. And you have control over how those funds are invested. You say, well, I don't know about it. I don't know anything about investing. But most people with their 401k plans hire a reputable firm to manage their funds. And I saw a report earlier this week that said that the growth in defined contribution accounts, those 401k type accounts, 
countrywide this past year exceeded the growth in these plans like the, like the state has, the, the uh, investment the, the Defined contribution as opposed to defined, defined benefit. benefit. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what the state has said is, well, we'll provide a, a benefit to you based on three things. One is your final uh, compensation, and it, it's, an, it's an average of your last, it used to be three, it's five. And uh, that's one of the factors. The second factor is for every year you work, you get almost 2% of, of that average final. Um, and then the third is more complicated. We don't need to get into, but it's a... It's Back a, to the original thought, to dealing with the 23 or the 35 billion, how you invest the money better or, or there's no way around it, we're just going to have to pay it or what do you think? Is there some way to deal with it better than what we're doing now? And if so, you know, what is when, I'm, it? when I'm faced with a financial problem, I always get the most reliable data that I can to analyze to answer questions like you just asked. We have a problem in this state because that information is protected by the agency that provides those retirement benefits, and that agency answers to members of the General Assembly not to members of the executive branch. They don't, a they don't answer to the governor. It's an executive branch agency. It doesn't answer to the governor. Uh, it doesn't answer to the controller or to the treasurer. It answers to budget writers in the General Assembly. Now, I pity the poor budget writers in the General Assembly. They don't want to have to deal with a 23 or $35 billion deficit. They don't want to have to budget for that. And so they lean heavily on the retirement system to provide them numbers to show that they don't have to deal with it. And so the, the retirement system hires specialists, specialists, actuaries, you know what actuaries are? They're really dry. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to be an actuary when I was in school, but I couldn't. They said I didn't have enough personality. <laughs> but, uh, but the actuaries, Give, apparently give the retirement system reports that say, well, if this happens, if that happens, and this happens, then within a couple of years, you'll start to carve into that deficit. Well, they've been saying that for years. As long as I've been in office, the actuaries for the retirement system have given that report. Well, next year, it's still going to be a problem, but within two years, it's going to start turning around. How many times do you have to be told that? And, and the problem is no one but the retirement system and the budget writers in the General Assembly have access to that information. And as I've asked me personally, you know, one-on-one -on -one with actuaries, I'm told, no, you can't. We can't let you micromanage this. I'm not asking to micromanage it. I just want to know how bad the problem is and why it's that way. And without being able to analyze the numbers, who knows? Just, just a passing thought, and we'll move to a different subject. Uh, it's just, it's like you're talking about. You, you are counting our beans, and they're playing with our beans. You know, it's our money. I understand that they're investing people's money that they're putting into it, but at the same time, we're the ones that got to pay the bills. So we should be able to know what's going on, so we know what to do about it. But well, uh, they'll tell you. Well, we're taking care of it. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that assurance. <laughs> Jump to another one, then I'm going to turn the microphone over to you guys. Uh, totally different subject. You're talking about how well the state is doing and the business is coming in and that kind of thing, and that's all true. But we still have, the, if not the highest, one of the highest income taxes in the southeast on the state level. And when there has been talk of reforming our tax code or our tax system in South Carolina forever, doing away with the income tax, going to, you know, all kind of different ideas floating around out there. Do you think, it's, what do you think would be the best way to make us more competitive with Georgia and North Carolina and Florida and Tennessee? Because most jobs, I remember, not to cut you off, but I've, I've seen this uh, information in a couple of places over the years. Most jobs were not moving overseas. When jobs move, they move from one state to another. Sure. That's where the jobs go, from, from, one, from one environment to another environment, better environment. Well, I'll let you in on a dirty little secret. You figured part of it out, that we have a high rate of income tax. The, uh, 
the budget writers projected through an office called the Revenue and Fiscal Affairs Office that income tax, individual income tax receipts would grow by 3.6% last year to this year. That we'd have 3.6% growth. You say, well, that's pretty good. 3.6% growth. That is really good. Guess what our growth in income tax receipts have been this year? 10%. 10%. We calculated that, uh, they calculated that the growth in corporate taxes would raise. I've got the numbers right here for corporate taxes. That that the growth rate would be 4.5%. Get this, we've seen 37% growth in corporate income taxes this year. That's why, we've got, that's why we've got these tremendous surpluses that are accumulating. But you've got to stop and go, why? You know, how is it that we've had that kind of growth? And I think part of the reason in, on the individual income tax side is that the federal government, remember when President Trump gave tax cuts on the federal side? The state didn't really handle that one properly because the federal tax law was changed to provide you some federal tax relief. The flip side of that is that you lost some deductions on the state tax side that ended up making you pay more state taxes. Now, I had a debate with the head of the Department of Revenue and the head of our Board of Economic Advisors last week over that, and they said, well, you can't prove it. And I said, no, I can't. It's just intuition as an accountant. Um, I said, show me what's caused that growth other than that, because, I mean, we've had some economic growth in this state, but not to that point. So, I mean, we're, we're in the process of reducing corporate tax rates. It's, a, it's kind of a slow decline. We've got to do the same on the individual side. And my prediction is we're probably going to be driven to do that. To be competitive. To be. Yeah. Questions? Oh, okay. Or, the, or more than. Yeah. That's called spiking, and it's done. Hiring back after retirement so that you have a former state employee beginning to draw retirement and then coming back to the state and getting hired back, you would think that that is a double dipping that would really cost the state dearly. The way the state has dealt with that now, I mean the state caught on after a few years that that was really bad for the state. It's required those and those former employees who come back for reemployment to continue paying retirement benefits and they get nothing from it. Their benefits don't grow. Remember I said there was a formula. It's based on almost 2% times years of service times average final compensation. They don't get any more years of service. And so, and the, their average final compensation is frozen at the final compensation when they actually retired. So they, they pay in 11 point, just over 11.5% each employee, but then the agency that that employee works for pays in another 18.56%. So there's about 30% 
of that employee's wage going into the retirement system to try to deal with that deficit. But it's not nearly enough. Not nearly enough. understand that there's only about 58 cents out of every dollar uh, that is uh, coming from that employee's amount. Only 58 cents is actually going towards a deficit. Uh, can you uh, verify that point, uh, please, sir? Well, the retirement system says that nothing that the employee contributes is going to liquidate the deficit that exists. They use most of what the, what the, the employer pays in. And that's because the employer is not going to kick back. The employee will, because the employee will say, while I worked, I paid exactly what you told me to pay. Now what is this after 20 years, after 30 years, you telling me I didn't pay enough? Why didn't you tell me that 30 years ago? So I think to cut down on that possibility, the law was written to say that the deficit can be handled only by the employer contribution. And that contribution is going up now from 18.56 to 23.56 over the next uh, six, five years, five, six years. So. Uh, and, and the reason it's increasing is to deal with the deficit, but even then, the deficit is so huge that the formula that was devised on the front end for providing you benefits assumed that every dollar that was going to be needed to pay those benefits would be available to invest, and because they weren't, the formula is bad. The formula that was used to calculate what your cost of benefits would be, because it was based on the belief that every dollar that was needed to to provide your benefits would, would be set aside and would grow. And with your contribution, your employer's contribution, and the investment growth on those contributions, there'd be enough on hand when you retire. It didn't happen. So we now have about half of the funds on hand that that, that formula assumed we'd have on hand, which is why the deficit is growing by about a billion dollars, just over a billion dollars a year. This year, it looks like it's going to grow another 1.2 billion dollars because of that. We, you know, we're not earning on what we don't have. Is the bottom line. Alan Quinn from Easley, and I've got two questions, or had two. Two. Now, good accountants. There are three kinds of good accountants. Okay. There are those who can count, and there are those who can't. I've still got two questions. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I, I was telling the, on the, me. The first question is the percentage that we were talking about of what the DOT has spent on what they have collected on the new gas tax. Your answer was, I don't know. Did I say that? when asked why haven't they spent it. Oh, well, and, and, and we had a guy from the DOT that came up. His answer was the same thing. Well, I don't know. <coughs> Somebody's got to know. Actually, I think what he said was that they said they couldn't get contractors as part of the explanation. That was part of it. And was, yeah. so. But that's not a good reason. No. Oh. <laughs> I mean, we, we probably got contractors in other states would be glad to come to South Carolina and earn some money. The thing is, the director of the DOT now, now reports to the governor. Does he know? Does he know the why director, that money hadn't been spent? No, the director of DOT doesn't report to the governor. I thought they fixed that where she did. No, she reports to the DOT commission. And um, part of this Act 40 that pumped all this money into DOT added one more commissioner to the commission. So she now has nine bosses rather than eight. But um, the governor um, 
through his appointments to the commission can maybe impact her performance. You know, I mean, his appointees to the commission could bring pressure to bear on her, possibly, but it's not a, he doesn't have the direct ability to do that. He's got to go through a commission. Somebody's got to know the answer. Well, I think I that, mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's getting, that's, it's almost getting to the point of being criminal. You took this money, no, I don't, I you don't, passed this yeah. law that took our money, and you've got it sitting down there, and you want to spend it on interstates now instead of the original reason right. that it was collected, but you're not spending it. That don't make sense. No, I, I mean, I, you get all kinds of reasons why the money hadn't been spent. Probably the most convincing reason that the agency would give you is well, these projects require long-term planning, and we've got to have a workforce out there. Contractors are willing, but they can't find the folk to work on their construction crews and um, give us time. That's, you know, it's always give us more time. Okay. Now, you say, well, how come I don't know? I've got, uh, I had one other, one other. I've had a real frustrating week. That might be the reason I sound frustrated. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, I ran for office twice, 2016, 2018, in the state office, and didn't win, and ran on economic development for Pickens County. We were last. Three years ago, I think we still are, we were last in the state in economic development. And I know that comes from the county. That's under their basic control. I've been talking to the county council. I've had got good relations with them, and, and the new ones. And they keep telling me, we're, we're working on it. We've got some good stuff coming. We've got good stuff coming. OK? So I've been laying back and not talking to them too much about it, just uh, believing what they were saying. Well, last week. They made an announcement that we have 350 new jobs coming to Pickens County. One, one company? One company. About half of them are coming. They're, they're in Greenville. They're top paid people. They're uh, maintenance people, management people, and that kind of stuff are coming here. $8.50 an hour. That sounds like state wages. Well, my question it looks like we can't depend on our county to do what they're supposed to do. Is there anything that our state delegation can do in Columbia to help us? They tell us that it's not their job. In 1972, our state constitution was amended to provide what was called, referred to then as home rule. Home rule said that the, the county delegations Legislative delegations at the state level no longer control the function of local governments. That they had, they had to be supervised, managed, etc., by their local elected officials and not state elected officials. I think that was a, a pretty good change back in 1972. So, I mean, the state can the state can work with your county officials. Probably not state elected officials that would work. Be the State Department of Commerce. Every single <coughs> success story we've had in the state has involved the Department of Commerce coming alongside state re um, local resources to work to recruit, to bring in. And uh, I think without, I'm not aware of any major success we've had that hadn't involved the Department of Commerce. The head of the Department of Commerce came from BMW. It just seems to me like we've got to have some help here. We're last, we're surrounded by Greenville, Anderson, Oconee, top performing counties in the state, mm -hmm. and we're last. And I've worked on it, and I'm still working on it. I'm researching it. We're going to have a paper at the end of the summer to put out about what's happening, but I just don't understand Al, why you would accept I, those kind of jobs in, into a county that is already at the bottom. It's frustrating. 
I mean, I, I face frustrations on financial issues at the state level, like you face those frustrations here. My advice is to don't lose your enthusiasm in working to try to correct those problems and do it in a, in a winsome sort of way. In a what? Winsome, you know, an attractive way. Don't, you know. Well, I've been doing that don't with the council, the county council, <laughs> until uh, this week, and I, they won't even call me now. Well, I, they, I, they won't even return my call. Yeah. Um, Yeah, yeah. Teamwork. Anyway, if you could figure out, just let me know that if there's something our state delegation can do, you know, talk to somebody. If I could figure that out, I'd be the lieutenant governor instead of that Pam. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Seth? Yeah. Thank you, Rick. And thank you, Mr. X, for being here. Uh, my name is Seth Powell with the Freedom Action Network of South Carolina. And I have to say, it is a. Uh, a great breath of fresh air to hear an elected official actually own up to the fact that our roads are not getting fixed. But we drive on these roads all the time. We know they're not getting fixed, right? So as, as much as the facts and figures show us, we, we see it with our own eyes. My question is, who do we hold accountable for that? And, and the way I see it, it's one of two ways, and I guess the second way is a mixture of two. Either we just hang our head low and hope for the best going forward, that our roads are going to magically be fixed if they raise a billion instead of the 600 million that they already have off the new gas tax hike. Or we either go to the governor and demand that he fire these SEDOT commissioners if they're responsible and he has the authority to do that. Or we hold our state legislators accountable, the ones who raise the gas tax, the ones who help appoint these SEDOT commissioners. And just as someone as an elected officer in South Carolina, and as people who are activists that want our roads fixed, who do you suggest we hold accountable, and what do we do to actually get that money to fix our roads that we were promised it would do? The money's there. Absolutely. I didn't have access to that information, and so spent probably six months with the Department of Transportation trying to extract that information. When I finally got to the point of saying, I'm getting stonewalled badly here, I went to sympathetic members of the legislature and said, can you help? Now, there are many of them who wouldn't be sympathetic, but a, but a few of them are. And one well-placed inquiry from a sympathetic legislator to the Department of Transportation would probably do more good than rolling down to Columbia in a tank. So I just want to reiterate that, if you don't mind. So if we want our roads fixed, we need to go to our state legislators because they have the best access to the SEDOT. They do. And they can get the best answers for us when it comes to getting our roads fixed. They can. And if you can find one that's on the, either the House Ways and Men's Committee or the Senate Finance Committee, mm -hmm. they have a lot more influence. Thanks, because sir. the agency depends on them for their own funding. Thanks, sir. Anybody else? Jeff, I can't believe you don't have a question for a CPA. <laughs> the train with you. I hear you. Talking the same language. Now, this is the uh, chairman of the Anderson County GOP. Oh, yes. But I have, a, and I think we joked about 385 and 85, everybody thinks they're getting money there, but it's all federal. Which brings me to the two, well, two questions, of course. 95, it's a federal road, inter, interstate. Yes. So mm -hmm. why would we want to put the toll on there? But that's just kind of facetious because I think they did um, vote that down. But we said at the local, he's talking about local issues to bring in commerce, but we turned around and gave a bunch of money to a billionaire to build a practice field in Rock Hill, and the people aren't going to be moving here. They're already living right around there, so it's not creating any jobs. It's not creating any homes being built. It's just money out of our pocket to satisfy a billionaire who didn't need the money, 
and it's just kind of frustrating to the public. It's not cash being paid over, by the way. It's tax breaks, but those cash breaks have to be earned. There have to be so many jobs created before those tax breaks can be earned. So this is a kind of fee in lieu <laughs> type situation? It's not called that, but effectively, th effectively it is. They love to use that in the interest in that fee in lieu. Sure. They, they keep the state income tax from their employees. Instead of sending it to the state, they keep it. Isn't that the way it works? Uh, yes. Yeah. So naturally, instead of us giving them money out of the treasury, I mean, it still comes out of our pocket in the end. It, but it instead will, of yeah. it's money that we weren't going to get, that we weren't counting on. I mean, I get what you're saying. I'm not, but if they live in North Carolina, five miles down the road, they're not going to be paid South Carolina taxes. That's true. That's true. Well, I wasn't arguing for the billionaire. I was just trying to clarify how, that, how it worked. But if they live in North Carolina and work in South Carolina, they, they'll have to file a South Carolina right. tax return. And they're already working for the, the Panthers. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're creating, we're bringing in $5 million for the Panthers. Yeah, on that note, my understanding is that these players pay state tax to whatever state they're playing in. That's my understanding. So we're, they're going to be playing in Charlotte. So those state taxes, their state taxes are going to be going to North Carolina, and they ain't going to play, be playing no games down here in South Carolina. But those players weren't really part of the discussion. It was the employees. The overhead but but the they also pay Georgia taxes. The Panthers, when they play in Atlanta, they're working in Georgia and they have to pay Georgia taxes. That's true. I'm just saying they spread their money around all over the league. Except here because we don't have a stadium. They don't play here. That's right. Uh, professor. Thank you. As I listen to you, uh, uh, it seems that an awful lot of these decisions are made on an irrational basis. And uh, I think you really had a lot of the answer earlier when you commented that, uh, you know, we, we, we do just that. And I just wanted to comment that it's very clear now from, from research in neuroscience that Virtually all political decisions and all economic decisions are made in the emotional brain that we have rather than the rational brain that we have. And I would I, agree on, on the political I just, side. What is yeah. your comment? Well, I mean, I think economics is quantitative, unlike the political sphere. My dad was an economist, so I'm sticking up for him. He's deceased now. but. Um, uh, he was probably one of the most quantitative persons I ever met, which is probably why I got into accounting. Um, so, you know, right brain, left brain, I don't know. Who knows? Um, but, I mean, I don't, I don't think anyone can defend the suggestion that political decisions aren't, aren't based on logic. Because they're not. Um, Politics you, is emotional. You brought up the Panther. Uh, the Panther um, considerations there. I mean, it was a political decision, uh, and a lot of it, a lot of the decision that was made was based on a hope that something would transpire. Uh, th there you have a Democrat senator, though, who I always thought was one of the worst people in the world who probably took the most reasonable position of the entire General Assembly on that one, a new Democrat senator from Richland County, said, I'm going to hold this thing up until I can get assurances that we're going to get so many people into South Carolina. And I thought, wow, that's pretty good. This past week, he took a similar rational approach on another issue that had come up. And I thought, man, this guy ought to be a Republican. <laughs> the way he thinks, or an accountant. He's a lawyer, but um, I think, you know, the, I, I don't think either party has, a, uh, has the answers. I don't think either party can be blamed. I think everybody's kind of equally guilty of, of looking at tax dollars as 
Plato as monopoly money almost, and not connecting the tax dollar to your wallet and mine. I wish I, you know, I wish it wasn't that way. All right. With the, um, I'm Ed Lees from Pickens. Um, with the nine billion dollar budget that came across the McMaster's desk, and the forty point seven million dollars that was He's taken vetoed. out in the twenty eight vetoed. In your opinion, was there enough vetoes to take out? Was it a rational? Budget does it look good helicopter view as an accountant? How deep are your are your hands in that, that budget was presented to him five days ago, right? And he had his entire staff pour through that budget. It's a document this thick uh, I haven't gone through it line by line. I know the 28 items he identified in his veto message uh, had I been aware of them and had I been in his shoes, I'd have done the same thing because most of them were, were pass-through expenditures, meaning that they weren't going to a state agency to spend for some state service. They're going to a state agency to dole out who knows where. They were given very broad general descriptions like local law enforcement grants. Tourism and state parks, you know, it was a, it was a huge amount, um, but it was pass-through money, what we call earmarks down, down there, earmarks in the budget, not agency budget dollars, but dollars that are earmarked to go to an agency, and then that agency just, who knows what the agency does. There's no accounting from that point on, which is why the governor vetoed those items, and I I trust that his staff found every one of those because that's, um, in my reading of those 28 vetoes, uh, they all had that one thing in common, that they were earmarks, pastors. I think, uh, winding this thing down, but I think the frustration is, it stems from this. The Republican Party platform and the Republican Party philosophy does not support picking winners and losers. We're, does not support picking winners and losers. What we need to be doing going back, and this is just my humble opinion, but as a conservative and as a member of the Republican Party, what we need to be doing is going back to the tax policy we was talking about a while ago, make South Carolina competitive so people want to come here so you don't have to bribe them and give this guy a better deal than this guy's getting. Put the tax code and the... the it's, it's simple. Make it a friendly environment for business. Make it business friendly. Fix the tax code where we're competitive and people will come here without having to give them a $500 million deal and build them an interchange and all that kind of stuff. Be competitive with the states around us and they'll come. Have a better deal in South Carolina than North Carolina's got. You don't have to bribe the Panthers to come here. They'll come here because it's, they, they want to sure. and we've got a better environment for them to be in and everybody else would too. But it's, that's, that's yeah. my two cents. Uh, the tax incentives are really the tail chasing the dog yeah. uh, because if North Carolina offers incentives, then South Carolina says, well, we've got to. And so South Carolina does, then Mississippi says, well, then we have to, too, to be competitive. And over and over and over again, that happens. You know, where it's hard to, to say that in every case those incentives don't work, um, should Republicans, should conservatives use government to pick winners and losers? No, no. Um, huh? I believe they call that crony capitalism. They call it that, yeah. Um, it, uh, you know, when, when you start analyzing, though, the economic impact that BMW's had, I mean, BMW had tremendous incentives offered. That's why I mentioned it. Um, Boeing wouldn't be here without those incentives. Correct. Volvo wouldn't be here without those incentives. The state set aside, worked with the local government to set aside 4,000 acres to induce Volvo to come. 4,000 acres, 2,000 of which are going, to be used, are going to be used to feed the supply chain for Volvo to bring in, bring in suppliers. BMW has suppliers now, I think, in every county of the state.
that have come in and haven't been offered incentives. I've got a friend that lives here in Easley that runs to Charleston and back every day, yeah. bringing par picking up parts from Charleston and bringing them back to Greenville or to yeah. Greer for the assembly for the assembly plant there. Uh, that's a tough one, Rick. That's a real tough one, though. The the whole incentive argument it, it for is. or against. I, I mean, get your point. I get your point. You get, uh, but I still maintain that it's something that's just innately unfair. To if you've been if you've had a business here and been providing jobs for people for 40 years and you give and you give some new guy to come in a better tax break than this guy that's been here providing jobs all those years, it's just not right. No, it's not right. It should be a level playing field, in my humble opinions, yeah. and set the system up where it's competitive and people want to come here. Well, yeah. you know, if Davos Sweeney hadn't started playing, paying all those football players, then Will Muschamp wouldn't have had to. Absolutely. <laughs> I can't tell you how much I appreciate you driving up here today, and I know you yeah, had an appointment pleasure. right up close to 5 o'clock, and you had to jump in the car and come straight here. Kelly comes straight from school, and it is much appreciated. Uh, and uh, we will put this up on YouTube and spread it all around the state so a whole lot more people can see it. And let me I checked a few minutes ago, but let me check it one more time. I thought this new little deal, we might get some... Ideas are easy to come by. Good ones are very hard to come by. Didn't get any. <laughs> but we'll try it again the next time. But you guys, thank you for coming. And... It's a pleasure. A couple of little announcements, or a couple of announcements. As usual, this time of year, we take a break in the summer from doing these Thursday night meetings once a month in June, July, and August, and we'll be back in September. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to try to work on doing this, this charity thing off the ground where we're, we're playing bingo maybe once a month and uh, give the money to a local charity at each one, uh, the school system, uh, the parenting center. Had a couple of other ideas, a couple of other places, but we'll see how that works too. Like I say, some, it's easy to come up with an idea. Uh, good ideas are hard to come by. So we'll see how this one flies and try to give it a shot and maybe try to kick that off in September, maybe before if I can. But all of you, be safe going home.